For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is now the conclusion of this message. My Bible says, children, obey your parents. Now, you're not going to nullify that. If they'll obey the parents, God will come down on that parent like a ton of bricks if they're forbidding that child to do what's right. Same thing, gal. You're so aggravated that old mean reprobate you live with. You really want to get him in trouble? Obey him. God will get on him like you wouldn't believe. And you can't turn him. You've tried to for years and it didn't work. He just gets meaner and more stubborn and more hateful. Why don't you back off and let God work on him a while? All right. Some of you are looking at me kind of funny now. <laughs> Our church is full of people who have tried out God's way and finds out it works. And by the way, God doesn't, God's Word doesn't need defending. Just needs preaching and believing. We don't argue with people about deliverance. We have a lot of people who don't believe what we say about deliverance. That doesn't bother me. God told me a long time ago, don't debate, don't argue, just preach it. And go after those that are hungry. Don't worry about the others. You haven't got time to stop and argue and debate with them. Besides, debating is just listed right along with adultery as the work of the flesh. Do you know that? Don't get involved in that kind of stuff. The devil loves to do that. Honest questions, oh yes, you can do your best to deal with those. When somebody just gets nasty and ugly, I want to straighten you out on this preacher. I said, all right. They'll rip out at me about something. I say, okay. That takes the wind out of their sails. You mean you're not going to argue with me? I said, why should I? You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you think you're right, and I know I am. But I'm not going to get upset about it. Why should I get upset? If you get upset, it means you're in a position of weakness. Did you know that? I told you that yesterday about dealing with the demons. Same thing about people tying into you about what you believe. Don't get all upset. If you're really sure of your ground, just be quiet about it. And quietness and confidence will be your strength. Just know what you're talking about and stay with it. Amen? Let's go to the seventh chapter of Second Kings, please. Talk about four leprous men. I ran across them a while back, and it thrilled my soul because I found some teaching in there, I think, that throws a lot of light on how God operates. Second Kings chapter 7. Now, in the, in the sixth chapter, you'll find the background of this. In the 25th chapter, there was a great famine, and the armies of the enemy had surrounded the city of Samaria. A donkey's head was being sold for an unbelievable bunch of money. They were even selling dove manure to eat. And they got in a wrangle about eating babies even. It was a mess. It was a horrible thing. They got into cannibalism because the famine was so severe. They were walled up in the city. The enemy had come around them, and there was no way they could get out or in. And the food supplies were dwindling fast, and people were starving. I mean, you'd have to starve to want to eat a donkey's head, I would think, or dove manure, and that's what they were selling for food. Now, in the seventh chapter, it's reached its climax. Elisha, the prophet of God, said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, two measures of barley, for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now the Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, his right-hand man, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in the heaven, might this thing be? And Elisha looked over at him and said, Well, you old reprobate, you will see it with your eyes, but you will not eat a bite. Now, there were four leprous men entering in at the gate. Now, if you were a leper in those days, the only way you could make a living was to beg. Well, beggars have a hard time ordinarily. 
But in hard times and war times, they have special problems. Here are these four men who are lepers. They're at the gate of the city. They had to cry unclean, unclean every time somebody came by and move off the main roadway so they wouldn't touch anybody or else they'd be killed. The only, only fellowship that lepers had was another leper. Leprosy is a picture of sin in the Bible, always. Cancer kills and destroys tissue, and, but it usually causes terrible suffering and pain, as you're well aware of. Leprosy is another disease that kills and, and destroys tissue, but it's different in that leprosy destroys the nerves first, then it destroys the flesh, which rots away. And so the leper is never in any particular pain. As the flesh rots away, the nerve endings are killed as it goes. First the nerve goes, then the flesh drops away. And isn't that the way sin works? The sinner isn't particularly aware of how bad off he is until it's far too late to do anything about it. These leprous men cluster together, as lost people do, because they are sinners do, because they had nobody else they could have fellowship with. They're at the gate of the city. They're not inside. They're not outside. They're just in between the army and the gate. And they have a conference. They said, why do we sit here till we die? Isn't this stupid? We're sitting here. We're starving to death. Now, there was no food in the city, so there was nobody to share anything with them. The army, the enemy armies encamped in a circle around that city, and here they sit. They said, if we enter the city, then the famine is in the city, and we'll die there. There's no use going in the city. They haven't got anything to eat either. They're dying. If we sit still here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, and let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we'll live. If they kill us, we can't do anything but die. These are four desperate men. They said, if we go in the city, that won't do any good because they have nothing to eat there. They're starving, too. If we sit here, we'll die. If we go to the Syrians, it may be they'll kill us. But since we're going to die anyway, they just might save us alive. If they do, we've gained. If we sit here or go in the city, we're surely going to die. So they took the only course out, and they headed for the Syrian camp. They rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the outer, uttermost part of the camp of Syria, tents were all there, clothes were all there, weapons of warfare were all there. Now notice what had happened. For the Lord had made the hosts of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots, a noise of horses, and a noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the Egyptians, to come upon us. And they arose and fled in the twilight, left their tents, horses, their donkeys, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. Do you know the Lord can do things like that? There was no way that army could have been broken. But God scared the living daylights out of them. He caused them to hear a noise. Now, I don't know whether there was any chariots or any great host coming against them. I doubt it. I think God thought it would be funnier if no angels or anything showed up, if they just heard the noise. God has a sense of humor, you know. Well, of course he does. He made monkeys and some people. He'd have to have a sense of humor to do that. And I believe that he played a trick on those folks, and they heard the noise of a great host, and they said, Oh, we're lost. They've brought an allied army against us, and we must flee for our lives. They ran off and left all their equipment, all their food, everything. Now, when those lepers came to the outermost part of the tent camp, now look how shyly they're approaching this place, because for all they know, they're going to get their throats cut or a spear through them for their efforts. When they come up, they don't find any guards on duty. They go to the first tent. And there was food and drink, and boy, they sat out and had a feast. They were starving, they were hungry, so the first thing they did was to eat and drink. Then they looked around and they saw silver and gold and clothing, 
And they grabbed a bunch of it, and they ran off and hid it. They thought, boy, you know, we don't know how long this is going to last, so we better grab it while it's here, and we'll just run hide some, and then we'll have some when the, uh, in case the situation changes. And then they came again. They went to another tent. And they said, oh, wow, here's some more. Let's carry off some more food and some more clothes. They, they just stopped by, just like little ants running back and forth, hiding this stuff, taking out the tents. Now, then they said to one another, we're not doing well. We do not well. This is a day, this day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. We're not doing right. We've stumbled onto life giving food and drink. We've stumbled onto riches untold, and here we are hogging it all for ourselves. Shame on us. And he said, if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Therefore come that we may now go and tell who? The king's household. They're starving. They're locked in their theological towers. They're doctrinally sound. They're inside that wall city. Nobody can break those walls down. Of course, they're starving to death inside the city, but they got the city. Are you following me? They don't know that just outside the gates there's treasure untold and food unlimited to be just had for the taking. But they got their rigid theology walls erected. They're protected against all this false stuff. You see. But the king's household is starving, and they're feeding on unbelievably poor fare inside. They're even eating one another. What did Paul say? If you bite and devour one another, what's going to happen to you? Gingham dog and the calico cat. Won't be anything left of either one of them when they get through. That's what they were doing. They were arguing and bickering and settling theological questions. But that doesn't feed the people. The people are starving to death on the inside. They're safe inside the city. But safety is not much if you're dying, is it? Now. Let's see what they did. They went to the king's household, announced the good news. Praise the Lord, guess what we found? Some of you did this. You tried to go back to the king's household, didn't you? You thought they'd be glad to see you, because you knew they were starving, and you were so thrilled because you found a life-giving river. You found bread to feast on. You found, found new clothes to wear. And you found treasures, treasures you, beyond your wildest imaginations, all just for the taking. They called the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians. Behold, there was no man there, neither the voice of a man, but the horses tied, the donkeys tied, and the tents as they were. Well, that got caused a little excitement on the wall. The porter was the guy who kept the gate, so he relayed the message to the next ring of sentries, and they told it to the king's house. They began to spread the word. Well, the king got up in the night and said to his servants, he said, uh-oh, watch it. I know what they're fixing to do. They tried to proselyte. They after our folks. Amen, or oh me, whichever. All right. Oh, listen. Why would God's people do other people of God like that? The blessed thing is that they're ready to get free. They want to be loose. Well, they take the horses, two of them, and they send out to sea. They said, go and check it out. Well, they went out to Jordan. They looked and they saw... Garments and vessels, they, they found a trail. When the Syrians started out, I guess some of them tried to carry some stuff with them. And the further they got, went, the more frightened they became, and they just dropped everything. And finally, they just barely got out with their clothes. They left everything strewn along. The, it looked like a, where a garbage truck had gone along and just dumped stuff off as it went. There's just vessels and clothes and everything else laid along the road. And they came back, told the king. Then the people went out. 
You can get hold of the king, you can get the people loose to get them out there to get what's out there. That's the reason I go after these preachers. They're the hard-headedest ones of all. <laughs> you can never get the preachers convinced there's something there for their people. First, they're interested. Then they find out it's hard work. It takes long hours. You're liable to wrinkle your suit. You might not know. You will not be popular. <laughs> and some of them find a better way and leave their people in bondage. I don't understand that. I'll repeat again. Deliverance is not a cure-all. It's not instant holiness. It does not substitute for any legitimate spiritual exercise of studying the Word of God, praying, walking in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit. It doesn't substitute for any of those things. But what deliverance does do, nothing else will. If you need deliverance, you're going to have to get that niche fixed. It's not the whole pie, but it's a piece of it. And you're going to have a gap in your theology and in your life until that's taken care of. Well, the uh, people went out to spoil the tents of the Assyrians. And sure enough, there was a mighty drop in prices. The inflation was over. The shortage was dissolved. And prices dropped to rock bottom because everything was available at an extremely reasonable price. Food was once again, as, as Elisha had said. Now, before they went out, the, Lord, the king turned to the man on whom he leaned, his right-hand man, and said, I want you to be in charge. You go down by the gate and take charge, and uh, you kind of look after it and see that it goes orderly. Well, that fool made the mistake of getting in the head of those people. He got in the gate, and he said, Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, everybody line up now. But you know, the word had already spread from the people that came back. You've never seen so much food in your life out there. And these people were like a herd of cattle who had been starved for water. And all of a sudden, there's, there's a creek up ahead. And there's a fence between them and the creek. Now, what's going to happen to that fence when those cattle smell that water? They're going to go through that fence and anything else that's between them and that water because they've got to have it. That's exactly what happened. There was a great swelling cry from behind. And before that guy could get his, arra his arrangements made, they ran over him like a bulldozer. He was flattened out and trampled underfoot as a starving people heard the good news that there was food aplenty, there was treasure unlimited out there. Some of these preachers are going to get trampled down, too. They get in the way of their people, between their people and that food. The bread of the children's out there. And sooner or later, somebody's going to tell them it's out there. And the people tried on him in the gate, verse 20, and he died. It's very dangerous to get in the way of where God's moving and try to stop God's people from getting what God wants them to have. I believe we can learn some lessons from this. There is bread for the children. There is living water for those who are famished and thirsty. There is new clothes. There's silver and gold provision unlimited just outside the gate. Now, the devil has caused everybody to be afraid and said, Now, you better not get over in that field. I heard about preacher so-and-so, you know, and they went over there, and I'll tell you, they just uh, they locked them up in the insane asylum. I wouldn't doubt it. I've heard worse than that. But that doesn't make any difference. I've heard of some people who went to church and went nuts, too. That's not going to stop me from going to church. I've heard about these people. You know, well, they read the Bible and it drove them crazy. Didn't do it. Reading the Bible didn't drive them crazy. They had something else on the inside that made them go nuts. It wasn't the Word of God that did it. The Word of God will fix you up, not tear you down. The Word of God edifies and builds. 
And I'd challenge you to seek the Lord about this matter of deliverance. There are hungry people everywhere. If you want to get into a field that's not crowded, you can try the deliverance field. There's not anybody there. I've been all back in the deep woods, and I can't find hardly any trace of human habitation back in there at all. I wind around, and every once in a while I bump into somebody. They say, we believe in deliverance. I say, oh, praise the Lord. It's like running onto a tree in the desert, you know. You think, oh, how wonderful. And then you get to talking to them. What they're talking about and what I'm talking about is altogether different. We had, <laughs> we've had this happen a few times. I remember uh, two or three years ago, somebody came in. Our young people, as you see, they're, they're very afraid of demons. They're, you know, reluctant to tie into them. You've noticed that. Uh, my lands, it's just like dropping a handful of rat terriers in a room with a bunch of rats. They go to scent and looking for them. Those rats know they're there, too, and they go up the wall screaming and hollering and having a fit. We can't even go to a full gospel meeting too well. Uh, one time we went... We took a bunch of kids to, you know, uh, they were scattered around. I looked over there, and I thought, oh, good Lord. There's such a man I knew to be an epileptic, and here was two young people sitting on each side of him from my church and one sitting behind him. And I thought, oh, dear, I bet that epileptic demon can't take that. He'll get scared and panic. And it wasn't long until that man had a violent seizure. That demon got so scared just for those kids sitting there. They weren't doing anything. And as soon as he fell on the floor, they looked at me and said, they get him? And, uh, and I, I, I said, no, no, because, you know, the full gospel people in that particular group were a little bit skittish, and I didn't want to upset them anymore. I mean, we'd already got a bad name, you know. They always kind of draw up sometimes when we walk in someplace. They think, oh, no, there's Worley and his bunch, you know. <laughs> and we try to be nice. I mean, we just sit there, and we won't even pray about it or anything. You know, we do buy in spirits. We see something out of order, but we don't make a big commotion about things. And we won't attack the enemy unless he just gets out of hand, and he usually does. But uh, at any rate, you, if you want to get into a field that's not particularly crowded, you can get into deliverance. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you might get beaten around quite a bit. The devil will be after you. You just think you've had trouble until you start over in this area. Uh, he le he's got big guns on this road, friend. This is the last road to be opened to complete the restoration of the body. I'm not saying the other things are not important. I'm just saying there's a lot of people on the trail, a lot of them on the evangelism trail, a lot of them on the healing trail, and I'm for all that. But I'll tell you, when you come to the deliverance trail... There are just a few that have gone through. Old Derek Prince, bless his heart, he went down through there with a the bulldozer. They tried their best to shoot him down every which way. Basham trailed along behind him. And then there's a few others that have paid dearly for rooting up the ground. And every one of them, just about, just like I was, I didn't know there was anybody else in it until they got pitched into it themselves headlong. I'll tell you, once you get into it, you start looking around for somebody that knows something. Because you figure anything you can learn will help. When you're in an all-out war, and the demons have told us repeatedly, if you fools had any idea how much power you have in his name, and they kind of, yeah, then they said we wouldn't have a chance. I'll tell you, my people are busy scratching, hunting. We're, we're getting it together. We're, we're getting little pieces here and pieces there. We're getting that jigsaw puzzle together. We're finding a piece. Uh, every once in a while, somebody kind of said, Pastor Willie, here's a piece I found where one fits here. It fits right here, right here, right here. My book's full of those little jigsaw puzzle pieces that have come together. Many of them my people have brought to me. Our church is half men, half young people, over half of them converted Roman Catholics. They make good demon fighters. Episcopalians, Lutherans, Baptists, they all make good demon fighters. We had one time a bunch of kids were ministering to somebody that had been fighting a demon about two hours. It was a monster. They had a rhinoceros by the tail, and he was in no means disposed to leave. 
and he was arguing with them, and they were hitting him with Scripture and everything they could think of and prayer. They were switching. They'd switched relays of workers on him two or three times, keep fresh workers at him all the time. He was wearing down, but he hadn't given up. There was a young man walked in. He sat down on the front bench. I know she's a visitor. He'd come in late. And I walked over and introduced myself. I said, have you ever seen deliverance before? And he said, oh, yes. I know about that. I said, uh, oh, well, that's good. I said, uh, he said, they're doing it all wrong. I said, is that so? I said, uh, how do you do it over at your place? He said, well, we don't do it. I said, I like the way we do it better than I like the way you don't do it. <laughs> Another time, a fellow pulled about the same stunt, said they're doing it all wrong. I said, oh, is that so? I said, because I'm always ready to learn. If somebody really knows something, I'm ready to learn. And, uh, I mean, I haven't learned it all. Some people have. I haven't. I just know a little peace. But the little peace you do is dealing with misery to the enemy. Don't you forget it. You mean think I'm going to throw away my little rock just hoping to get a boulder. I'm going to use that little one until I get a bigger one. But uh, anyway, this, this fellow very arrogantly told me, he said, they're doing it all wrong. I said, oh, I said, well, how would you do it over at your place? He said, well, you're not supposed to argue with those things. You're just supposed to speak and they leave. I said, is that so? I said, well, they've been fighting that thing about three hours. Why don't you walk over and speak to it and tell them to leave? They'll let you in there. Help yourself. I said, those kids are tired. I said, they've been working hard. I said, if you can get him out that way, praise the Lord. Go over and hit him. I don't feel led to. <laughs> Boy, that's a cop-out if I ever heard one. I said, fellow, why don't you just shut your mouth? You don't know nothing. I said, you've been batting butterflies and chasing blackbirds. You don't know nothing about these rhinoceros, water buffaloes, and Bengal tigers. You get one of those birds by the tail, and they'll put up a fight. You can run, skip through the tulips all you want to, and the butterflies will just flush and run before you. Real easy. Out in the name of Jesus. Out in the name of Jesus. You can flush the blackbirds that way. Just wave your arms at them. They'll leave. That's the little ones. But you get a genuine grown-up monster, and he'll, he'll say, what, are, what do you think you're doing? Some of you have heard one of those monsters or two around here, haven't you? He didn't sound disposed to leave at all, did he? There was one in here last night, a karate spirit, and he pitched a guy right up straight up in the air. He wasn't disposed to leave either, but he did. But, of course, you have to use the Bible pattern. You see, that's physical force and spiritual power. You don't use one or the other. You use both of them. Put the moxie on these things. It takes both. The army of Israel walked around the walls of Jericho, according to God's pattern. But they still had, the army had to go in and mop up after the walls fell. You better think through what the warfare scriptures are about. Because God's got it all in there. We can put it all together. There's too many people trying to find an easy way, and there isn't any. Paul said he fought with beasts at Ephesus. What do you think he was doing? Playing... Playing with the puppy dogs or something? That's the letter he wrote. That's the place he wrote and told them about the armor they need to buck alone. He wasn't just kidding. You need every piece in place. If you're here today, by the way, several people have remarked to me and said, I can't get over how quiet your messages are. I said, oh, I can get steamed up. My folks have been trying to guide me into it. So, preacher, won't you get up there and just really let them have it? And... Uh, but when I'm talking about demons, I deliberately low-key. You know why? Because people are always saying, he went in there and he whipped those people into an emotional froth. And you can do that. Listen, I had 40 hours of psychology. I could pull strings here and get people swinging off the rafters here in a little bit. No way. The Holy Spirit doesn't need help. So I low-key my message and put it out there just plain, flat, Bible facts. Then when the results come in, it scares people to death. But they can't say he worked them up into a frenzy and then pulled the net. 
and got a bunch of hysterical people on the string. Now, people get hysterical sometimes, but that's just the demon getting upset. <laughs> when I hear them going off, I just say they're singing my song. I was, uh, was in tapes, you know, several hours of screaming. We taped off of the services. I like to tell folks, if I get a little restless at night, can't sleep, I just get my cassette and turn it on and listen to the screams of the enemy. So refreshing. So soothing to hear the enemy getting it for a change. Well, listen, I got tired of getting it myself all the time. Didn't you? Haven't you? I'm glad to hear the enemy doing some yelling. Somebody was telling me yesterday there was somebody up here and there was, there was such an ungodly noise going on. He was really worried for fear that person was being hurt. He talked to them after and found out they weren't hurting at all. I said, no, but that demon was hurting something fierce. And I said, it was high time. Those rascals deserve everything they get, and I hope they get it. Even today, don't you? Amen. It's not, volume is not power. This is power. Amen. The name of Jesus is power. A whisper in Jesus' name will scare the daylights out of a demon. You can yell and scream and jump and holler all you want to, and it won't scare a demon at all. Matter of fact, you'll say, I believe I'll jump and holler too. Mm -mm. If you want to scare them, drop down and sit on your authority. That's Jesus. He has all authority. He has all power. All you got to do is pull those saints over. It's like an old fish. Do you ever hang a big old fish? You see a big old game fish that hang down here in the bay? What do they do? You can't pull that rascal in right away, can you? Because he takes off and runs with that line, just runs. What do they do? If they sinks down on that line, what do he do? He'll snap it. So what do you do? Let him have some line. Let him run. And he gets tired. Take it up. He'll run again. Take him up. What are you doing? You're wearing him out. Listen, this spiritual warfare wears the demons out. Don't let, you, don't let them kid you. They'll say right up to the last breath, they'll say, I'll never, never, never come out. And out they go. They're liars. Well, of course they're going to tell you they're not coming out. They want you to give up. On the plains of hesitation, bleach the bones of millions who at the dawn of victory sat down to rest and while resting died. Keep after them. Somebody told me, said, your people are the most persistent I ever saw. Said, they just won't give up. I said, well, of course not. They got something treed in there. They want that thing out of there. And if they can't get him out, they're going to box him up, put an angel in there to read scriptures and torment the daylights out of him. Night and day, he does come out. Some people said, you can't do that. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but I'll guarantee you the enemy doesn't know that. You may know it because you're so theological, but they don't know it. So what we do, if we have to bind one up, he's especially ugly, we just ask the Lord to build a box, put him in it. Sometimes I tell him, build it real small, Lord. He doesn't seem to be too big. Just stuff him in there. We're not too uh, concerned about his comfort anyway. Stuff him in there, fill the box with the Shekinah glory of the Lord. Put an angel in there to read the scripture thing about the death and resurrection of Jesus, about the blood of Christ, and especially don't let that angel miss the scriptures on hellfire and the final judge. We've opened up some of those boxes a week or two later. I've had demons say, let me out of here. Let me out of here. That blankety like angel hadn't shut up night nor day. I'm going out of my mind. I want out. I want out. I said, I thought you were never going to leave. He said, shut your fool mouth, cloud of dirt. Let me out of here. And I mean, you don't, if you don't want to put them in a box, don't. But I'd rather put them in a box. And, keep, and, and I asked the person, I said, they've been bothering? He said, no, I've been having a good time. I've been sleeping good and everything. That demon said, I haven't had any rest. I'd rather the person get some rest, wouldn't you? Amen. That's using your authority, friend, to bind those things. Can you do it? You say, you can't command angels. Who said? Now, where'd you ever get a notion like that? You say, well, preacher, where'd you get the notion you could? <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. No. I got it out of the Bible. Jesus said, all power is given me in heaven and earth. He said, behold, I give you power. Did Jesus have power to command demons? 
Did he have power to command angels? In Jesus Christ, I also have that same power in his name and his authority to do this. A lot of people get mixed up, too, lest I don't get to cross this before the end of the week. Let me mention this. A lot of people say uh, they get all bent out of shape, too, because a lot of times uh, one of my favorite occupations is to corner a demon, torment the daylights out of him, and especially if he's a big, big wheel, and then I make him line up all of his lieutenants and all of his little ones and throw them out. Use his authority to throw them out. Well, now, they're not exactly anxious to do that, as you might imagine. But then I have a few little twists that I put on. My people do the same thing. And uh, they learned that from somebody. I don't know. But you, you put, there's a lot of little levers you can put on those rascals to make them more willing to do what they're supposed to. And somebody told me, you can't do that. If Satan cast out, you can't, Satan can't cast out Satan. I said, would you please go read that passage instead of just quoting a piece of it? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say he couldn't. It said if he does, his kingdom is destroyed. Jesus went forth to destroy the works of the devil. He told me to trail along in his tracks. And if Satan is forced to cast out Satan, he is destroying himself. And I think God gets a special pleasure out of that. I know that God enjoys the fact that clods of dirt. I've been called a clod of dirt so much. I'm one of the bigger clods. But the demons have looked at me a lot of times. One time one of them looked at me and said, Worley, you're just dirt, 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 dirt. I said, that's right. Oh, praise the Lord. Father, I thank you because you love me and I'm just a cloud of dirt. He said, shut your fool mouth. Well, I mean, he was right. I'm just a cloud of dirt, aren't you? You know, as big as I am, but you're still a cloud. And isn't it beautiful that God would use clouds of dirt to pull down the mighty princes? They rebelled against him and his glory. They chose to follow Satan. And how humiliating it is to be bulldogged by clods of dirt and to be brought down to the dust of defeat. One of them told me one time, he said, God's never been fair to us. He was a big old prince or chief prince. I said, he hasn't. I said, that's funny. I said, he's always been fair to me. I said, well, he hasn't been fair to us. I said, oh, really? How's that? I said, well, he threw us out of heaven. And then he threw us on the stinking mud ball and said, now, we don't even have worthy opponents to face. We have to face you stupid clods of dirt. I said, oh. And I said, we're winning, aren't we? He said, shut your mouth, Worley. <laughs> but of course, I didn't. I didn't pay no attention to him. And he had to leave. What I'm simply saying is, friend, that God is bringing the mighty down into the dust by using his people to destroy them. They're doing it in the power and authority of Jesus' name. There isn't any other. And as people come free, they make the best deliverance workers you ever saw. Praise the Lord. Are you here today and you need something from the Lord? I never feel easy when I'm in a service unless I at least mention the plan of salvation. You never know when there's a boy or girl who's never asked Jesus in their heart. Some young person, or maybe some grown person, who's sitting there, confused, disturbed, not knowing for sure whether they're born again or not. So let me say quickly that Jesus loves you, died on the cross for you, rose to heaven, and to guarantee every promise God ever made. Jesus himself said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door... I will come in. You can pray like this. Lord Jesus, if I have never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you right now, come into my heart, save me from all my sins. You can settle that if you would today. If you need help, if you need further confirmation from the Word of God, then by all means come talk to me or one of the workers here and say, I'd like to talk to somebody about salvation. Get it straight. Get it clear. If you are saved and you're being driven, harassed, and tormented by things you can't seem to handle, by all means, I would urge you to seek help 
There is help in Jesus. He does deliver the captives. He wants to deliver you. Good. Remember this. Demons can produce positive or negative behavior. Some people withdraw. Some people explode on the outside. But if it's something that's hindering you, by all means, I would advise you to seek help. I never run people down. If you don't care enough to come to the services or to come forward in a meeting, if you're afraid for somebody to know you have problems, well, don't spare God. I mean, he won't be embarrassed. He's known about it for years. I mean, you're not going to shock God. He wants to help you. He loves you. So if you have problems and you want prayer, by all means, come. I'm here. There are some other workers here. My workers from Chicago are here. And we'd be glad to do everything we know to help you. And many have already received help. I believe some are going to get help today. Let's stand. This is the end of this message. Our website is www lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.